This week is episode 60, and we're having an interview, a phone call discussion with Dr. James Lair, one of our pillars. Dr. James Lair, this should be fun. Jim, world-renowned sports psychologist, author of 17 books, most recently leading by character. Yeah. So many, power of total engagement, storytelling for mental toughness. Same number, 17, he's worked with 17 number ones that he's open to discuss. Yeah. A lot of... Uh, with confidentiality, a lot of the people he's worked with, number ones, from gold met gold medalists to Grand Slam champions, probably some number twos in there. Every sport, um, yeah. <laughs> he's talking to people like us, so he's definitely going to talk to some number twos. <laughs> but his gateway uh, to, to an amazing career is through tennis, um, all sports. Works with um, businesses, executives, members of military. Military and police forces just think there's a little more pressure dealing with someone with the bomb squad than a tennis player with his entourage. Yeah, just a little bit. Co-founder of Johnson Johnson, Human Performance Institute. Um, I'm sure one day he'll be a member of the International Tennis Hall of Fame. That's how big he is with what yeah, he's done for, for sure. tennis. Should be. Based on his work in the 1980s, um, I mean, Jim worked with a group of teenagers that all went on to be legends. But having worked with parents, players, coaches, I think this says it all. Arthur Ashe, the late Arthur Ashe said in the 80s, Jim Lair may be the most important most important person in all of tennis. Mm-hmm. Jim Lair may be the most important person in all of tennis. That's an important statement. I, I met Jim first in the late 70s. Uh, we had this two-year program for tennis teachers. Tennis tech. And Jim uh, came out on an every other year basis. We used his books, um, his workbooks, audio cassettes, videos. Um, as training tools. Mm-hmm. As you mentioned, he's one of our eight pillars. Set the standard for sports psychologists. Highest form of flattery is to be copied, and so many uh, people have molded their careers after Jim. Mm. Uh, if, if one were to study his work, read his books, listen to his lectures, um, from commentators to coaches to courtside interviews, you're going to hear the, the language of, of Jim Lair. Yeah. Father of three, now a grandfather, great laugh, great soul, world-class person. Let's get the man on the phone. Yeah, I was going to say, we did do a podcast on Jim Lair. It's episode 25 of this Great Base Tennis podcast. So if you haven't listened to that, you could go back and listen. You could listen to this first, but you could go back and, um, you know, I feel like we gave him a good good background there, a lot of info, it was a longer episode as well. So The two gyms, Jim Verdict. Jim Lair, I remember spending time with both of them. Yeah. And we just want to solidify uh, to talk to Jim Lair after we dedicated a podcast to him. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, Jim Verdict, the late Jim Verdict, uh, I did um, communicate with his son, Doug, and we want to do the same thing. Right. But yeah, let's give him a call. Okay, let's get get the doc on the phone here. Jim Lair. Jim Lair, welcome to the Great Base Tennis Podcast. Thanks for being with us. I'm very excited to join you. <laughs> Jim, we just uh, introduced you as a complete bomb that was kind of down and out, and we want to just lift your spirits. <laughs> so we thought we would talk well, to you for I, an hour. I, I, I understand that completely, and I'm excited that you're <laughs> going to lift my spirits. Things are depressing in Colorado these days, aren't they? Or no, where, where What's are, that? Are you in Denver, or where are you? You're in Colorado, yeah, right? I'm in Denver home here in Golden, Colorado. Golden, I have Colorado. all my kids and grandkids are here. So I was born and raised in Colorado. So I'm back home. I was in Florida for 35 years, but I'm back home to my roots. Yeah. Tell us where, the where, when, how. I mean, obviously you started with the being in Colorado. That's where the love of athletics started for you. Uh, what, yeah, what, you know, I've, all, I've, I've been... Uh, involved in competitive athletics my whole life. I played, my father was a semi-pro baseball player and I uh, played baseball for nine years. And then I played basketball at a fairly high level. And um, then I got involved in tennis and played tennis, you know, my entire life. Um, and uh, I guess my love of sport really kind of drove me. Um, although when I did my master's and doctoral work. I, I did it in 
in, in the whole psychological area, specializing in community mental health. And, um, mm. and uh, it was kind of by accident, I think, that I got involved in the application of psychology to human performance, uh, specifically to sports. Um, I was chief psychologist and executive director of a very large community mental health center that served the whole central and southern part of Colorado. It was a very big job. I was a pretty young guy right out of school. And uh, we had really nine offices. We covered an 8,600 square mile area in Colorado. And I thought that's what I would do for the rest of my life. But I ran into a guy that just completely changed my career, a guy by the name of Dr. Joe Vigil, who's a track and field legend. Um, he's an Olympic legend. He produced so many superstars in running and track and field, and he and I became good friends. He was in this catchment area that I uh, was uh, directing uh, uh, this mental health, uh, federal mental health center, and he kept challenging me. He said, Jim, of all you know about psychology, what can you, what can you tell me to get more out of my athletes? I'm always looking for an edge, and I said, Joe, I don't have a clue, because <laughs> I've, I've been trying to help people who are not well to get reasonably healthy, but I don't know how to take healthy people and make them extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I don't have a clue. <laughs> and he kept asking me over and over. And finally, I said, Joe, I'll do a literature search for you. And, um, and I started, there wasn't a whole lot. I went all throughout the world, really, to look to see who was doing stuff in mental training. And uh, he said, Larry, you ought to get involved in that. That's going to be a huge field. You know, you, know, you like being pioneers and things. Why don't you go after that? And he kept dogging me. And I worked with his runners. And there was a, a tennis team there. And I worked with the tennis team. And so I, I resigned to a 23-member board of directors. Um, they thought it was a ploy for more money. And <laughs> they offered me a ton more money. I said, no, no, <laughs> this is real. I'm going to go be a sports psychologist and they thought I had duly lost my mind because there was no such thing at that time and uh, so they just felt Lair really couldn't handle the stress and obviously <laughs> so should have just said one more year <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah one more so year. I moved to Denver and set up a private practice specializing in performance problems of athletes especially on the mental it's called the Center for Athletic Excellence and um, I, uh, I was right across the street from the University of Denver in their sports science department, and I formed an alliance there. And, um, and that's how it all began. And then I realized I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about this field. Nobody did. And um, so I wrote this book called Mental Toughness Training for Sport. Um, after I had spent two years at the Jimmy Connors United States Tennis Center, I left Denver because I really wanted to learn. Then I spent six years as director of sports science and director of sports psychology for the Nick Voluntary Tennis Academy. And that's when I actually started to learn something because I, I really didn't have, you know, there was just not that much out there. So it was kind of convoluted. Um, but uh, and then I went on, obviously, with Dr. Jack Roppel, and we started the Human Performance Institute in Orlando, Florida, and sold that to Johnson and Johnson. And uh, now I'm back in Denver, so it's been kind of a wild ride. But uh, I, I got into this by accident. I never, but my love of sport was always there. I just I wasn't sure how I could get back to sport when I was in uh, in really. Uh, more of a more traditional role in, uh, in psychology. Jim, uh, a few of our listeners are, are up there in age and would uh, get the joke when I would call you Fred McMurray, the TV show from way back when, uh, My Three Sons. Uh, I, remember, <laughs> I remember meeting uh, Jeff. We spent uh, some summers together. I think it was three at Sweetbriar, and he must have just been like 10 years old. And then, That's I, then, exactly right. then I saw exactly him in right. I saw him play uh, some college tennis when he was in Tampa. And then um, I actually saw him uh, at one or two uh, futures. He himself, uh, he, he could write a book uh, on tennis. Um, 
<laughs> with that, uh, you know, our listeners, obviously, you're, you're a parent. Uh, what, I mean, I know you've written volumes on this too, but what's the first thing that comes to your mind with parents? Like, say for today, uh, Dave Anderson, who you helped, who he's now in, in leading the facility, the flagship in Dallas, Brookhaven Club Corp, and he's developed over 500 college tennis players. I told him I was speaking to you this morning, and he said, ask him who needs more mental toughness help in the U.S., parents or, <laughs> or juniors? Uh, but why don't you just talk a little bit about parenting? Okay. I, you know, I wrote a book, Training Parents for Competition, because one of the great things that one of the most important insights I had was, you know, my being a tennis parent myself. Um, I have three sons, all of them played competitive tennis, but Jeff really, uh, you know, took to it, but it was not easy, um, you know, to, first of all, you know, a parent to kind of maneuver through all this, you know, most parents don't have a clue about how, how to parent properly. There's no rule book. There's no, you just go by instinct. And so often the instincts are wrong. And, but I, uh, I really tried to apply all the lessons I'd learned from working with so many players on so many different levels, all the juniors, all the pros I was working with on the tour. And, and I would spend 50% of my time that I was actually working with a particular player with a parent. The parents were the ones that were often the ones that were interfering with the progress. They thought they were doing the right thing. But um, they they got all excited about the, you know, there's something it's like almost intoxicating when you see your son or daughter starting to shine. And, you know, part of the scorecard that as parents we use is the achievement level of our kids. Mm -hmm. We kind of say, you know, if our kids achieve great things, it's a reflection of me. And so, and if they do badly, if they don't do well, it's also a reflection of me. So a lot of the identity and, you know, really the credibility that a parent has is they're always looking to see if their kids are achieving extrinsic success. Mm. And it's a really kind of dangerous path because you can be very successful in producing a, a you know a high level uh, athlete in whatever sport in tennis for instance but the cost may be so great and that the person may really have compromised a lot of the things that were really important in their development and I saw, I saw this all the time so it was uh, I've always said that the person is far more important than the achiever the performer person, um, is not nearly as important as the is is the person inside that there there's a performer inside of all of us and then there is a person um, and the development of that person should supersede everything else and I came to learn that the healthier you are as a person the better you tend to do in competition over the long haul and for the rest of your life and health is physical it's emotional it's mental, and it's also spiritual or character health. And I try to help parents get that perspective. They just, they're, they're obsessed with their kids winning. And uh, so they push them, they pay for things, they're crazy on the sidelines. They, when their kid loses, they lose. When, they, when their child wins, they become so proud, they walk around like they've just won Wimbledon themselves. And, but it's, very understandable because they spend a lot of money and pressure and time they transporting their kids all over the place the sacrifices and then when their son or daughter goes out and gets beat by a duck <laughs> in their in their mind they just literally go crazy they can't imagine after all these lessons this is what i get mm. and they're really expecting a return for all the time and energy and money that they've invested and the return they're looking for is extrinsic success, rankings, maybe a college scholarship, um, you know, all, all kinds of recognition and affirmation that they're a good parent because they produce someone who 
really stood out in the crowd. And so you must be pretty special. Hmm. Well, that scorecard is uh, very misleading and can be a, a tragic way to hold score. I want to know how the person is doing as a human being. How are they? Uh, how are they developing um, in terms of their identity? If their identity is their score, is their ranking, is uh, uh, pretty much dependent on things over which they have little control, like whether they get a scholarship or whether they play number one or two on their ten, on their high school team or whatever. Um, you know, it's a, it, it creates an identity crisis and. Um, I have had to work through, I've had to pick up the pieces from countless, every day I get an email from some of these kids who've been through the mill with their parents and they thank me for all the work I tried to do to preserve their past, their passage through tennis. And it was because the parents had no idea what they were doing. I mean, and parents, uh, and I'm not talking about being soft. I'm not talking about being, you know, marshmallows and pillows with your kids. I'm talking about getting the scorecard right. And what it re really matters is the health and happiness, well-being, developing a fully functioning person whose identity is not their bloody score, is not their bloody ranking. And it takes a lot of nurturing, a lot of careful, because tennis is a tough sport. Most sports are, but tennis it's a great sport for a lifetime, but all the injuries, all the bad losses, all the insults, all the cheating, all, all the stuff that goes on, the travel, the money, the sacrifices, you know, it's, it's not an easy trail. And when parents add more pressure, they are doing an enormous disservice to those kids. And my acid test is very simple. If your kids want you there in the match, then you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> Honestly want you there. But if they're actually much more comfortable when you don't come, because you're overly judgmental, you're always checking to see if they did this or that. The only thing I want a parent to do is to be pretty tough when it comes to cheating, uh, when their son or daughter starts acting like an idiot, starts acting like a two-year-old, screaming and yelling, throwing rockets. That's where I want the parents involved. I don't want them involved in winning and losing at all. All they want, if they give a, their best effort and they have a pretty good attitude, let's just go eat. I don't, you know, you got, you got double bagels and let's just go eat. I was proud of you because you hung in there. It doesn't matter. What matters is what's happening to you because you're chasing tennis. What kind of human being are you becoming? How's your ego? What kind of humility do you have? Are you becoming stronger as a person because you're you're up against a sport that's really tough? And one day you'll look back on this and tennis will become one of the greatest gifts you've ever had as a human being if you stay with it. And I want you to stay with it, but I'm not pushing you to win, but I'm asking you to grow up with tennis, become a better, stronger human being because of tennis, and uh, it will be a win for you. It'll be a win for all of us. You don't have to be top 10. You don't have to be top anything. You just have to be a person that I am proud of and that you are proud of. And we are going to make tennis uh, a gift for you and for all uh, all of this family because we can see you grow up with tennis. So that's it's kind of the presentation that I like to make. I just wish I could get to parents sooner because they make so many blunderous mistakes. And uh, most of it is around the scorecard. I think that's awesome what you just said. I think it's true for the coach as well, right? I mean, the coach is trying to mentor the player f for all those things as well as the X's and O's. We do have some parents that are the coach. I mean, how would you help a parent that has to play both roles like that where, oh, hey, I, I do have to, to cover some of the tennis side of things? Would, would you just try to set aside a different time to talk about a match, you know, after, hey, let's go eat? Or what advice would you give to a parent that has to be the coach as well? Well, that, that is a great question, and I've had to deal with that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, well, not, not nearly as much as just coaches in general, but players in general. But um, it takes a very special person. 
and I mean, I'm going to emphasize very mm. special, who can coach their son or daughter and also be a parent. Mm. And the reason is those roles are not always, they don't sync up. So the player's asking, are you speaking to me as my father? Yeah. Or, or are you speaking to me as my coach? You know, um, and those roles can get, and when they get confusing and when they get, you know, really, when you start getting really tough on them because of this or that, or they didn't do the right thing, you know, what comes through is this is my mom or my dad that's doing this. Um, uh, that's where the, it's not like my coach. It's very hard to make a distinction. So when this happens, I say, you've got to understand you have two roles to play and the highest priority. You can always replace a coach. You can never replace the parent. So if you screw up, you mm-hmm. screw up as a, as a coach, you never screw up as a parent if you can avoid it. And that the prioritization here is always be the father or mother, that's a female coach, female parent. You make sure that you know this is the this is your best self as a parent, and that you have the priority number one about the welfare, not your competitive the competitive success of your son or daughter. But you're concerned about them as a person, as a mother or as a father. That is your most important responsibility. And then if you want a coach, which is really dangerous, you have to be a special person who can draw very strict guidelines and you really know exactly where you can maneuver and where you can't, then you can do it. But I know very few people who can do both. There are some, they've been exceptions. But I've studied that for many years, and it's very hazardous. Mm-hmm. And at some point, almost all kids can't stand hearing anything from their parents. Mm-hmm. They reach a certain point where in mid-teens, it's really hard for them to listen. Now, maybe the parent was a great player, a superstar on the tour. The, you know, that you would think, well, that'll grease the shoe because they'll at least listen to me because I actually did it. I was a star. The really smart parents will go around and find a coach that they really, they, since they know tennis, they'll find someone who is extraordinary, watch it like a hawk, and let them do the teaching. And then they can work with the coach, but they don't do the coaching themselves. And uh, Peter Corda, or there's so many examples out there where mm-hmm. they are mentoring, but they're mentoring from a distance. And the coach is actually the one, whether it's in golf or tennis or any other sport. It's just, uh, it's like playing with dynamite Mm. because you can't keep the roles separate. And when you mix the roles, it can get really messy and you can get really successful, but the long-term consequences for that uh, may absolutely be uh, not worth the price that you had to pay. Now, a lot of coaches say, well, I can't afford, I'm a teaching pro, or I'm a, I just don't have the money to pay for another coach. And I say, well, then you're going to have to be very careful, but your number one priority is yeah, you great. are a parent first and a coach next. No, great Jim, this, uh, this next question, uh, I think you've already answered part of it with number one. Um, well, I always tease and I watch some, um, kid who's just unfortunately sadly hitting a ball so poorly and i go well i you know I obviously just say this whispering to the person i'm standing next to is their coach may not go to tennis heaven um but your 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 sister's your sister's a nun uh, there's obviously more important things to pray for than tennis such as the end of starvation or world peace but if you were to have your sister pray for tennis what would you have her have her pray for <laughs> Where does where, where, where's, where's tennis need its most help? Oh, that's a great, that's a great one. I would, uh, I would have her pray that um, parents get their priorities right and that the kids have safe passage 
and become better, stronger, character-driven human beings because of tennis and not the opposite. Character for me is the whole ball game in life. And if you, there are a lot of ways to get to the top of the mountain. You can take shortcuts, you can cheat your way, you can find a, a, a lot of, you can walk over dead bodies to get to the top. But I've worked with a lot of players who've been, I've worked with 17 number ones in the world in their sports. And I can tell you there is no substitute. It took me a long time to get there. The last 10 years of my life have been in the character space. And sustaining success, happiness, fulfillment, and satisfaction in life is related to your treatment of other people. And that doesn't mean you can't get unbelievable success. But there's a gnawing sense of, you know, kind of dissatisfaction in life if you really don't have what I call this hidden scorecard. Um, really get high marks on that. And you can also get high marks on your treatment of others and character and also achieve and become number one in the world. That's the that's the creme de la creme. I mean, that's the person we all want when I look at a Federer and a doll and the way they conduct themselves. And, you know, it's just like, it's it's so exciting to see our living examples. We have so many, you know, the way in which... Uh, uh, so many of these superstars in sport and tennis, Novak, all of them, when they actually have a moment where they actually can allow who they really are as a person to shine, we can get very excited. And the, the crowds know, they have a sense about who the person is. And they want, they want to be connected to people who are respectful and not arrogant, uh, who treat people fairly, who have, great, have a generous heart who are very grateful for all the gifts and they look back at all the people who helped them get there. They don't forget. They just realize that without all these people who stood by me and made sacrifices for me, um, I, I will never forget them. And I, and I will never let the world forget that I am here because of them. And I've stood on the shoulders of so many people who have lifted me up. And I am very humble about that. And, the more that actually, but that's ingrained in parent in parenting, never letting the, you know, the success in tennis breed this sense of omnipotence, you know, that I'm, I'm king or queen of the mountain and I, I'm just, I'm special and all that kind of stuff. And I just go, I've had to deal with so many, what I call prima donna mm -hmm. and, uh, it just doesn't last. It's just not much there. And it's all goes back to what parents, they allow their kids to get away with anything as long as they're winning. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can, as long as they continue to win, if they do some cheating, everybody cheats. Or if they treat other, oh, he's just under a lot of stress. That's why he did that. Or, you know, he's not getting good grades, but he's doing well in tennis and he's just going to have, you know, it's, we're let we're let slacking off a little bit here because he's doing so well. Those are absolutely catastrophic um, judgment failures on the part of parents. Jim, uh, you've worked with so many great players. Uh, one person I'd like to ask you about is Monica Seles. I mean, she statistically came out of the starting blocks. I mean, what she did, she won eight mm. eight eight Grand Slams before she was a teenager or as a teenager. One eight or eight of her nine. Um, at one time, she had a fifty-five and one record at Grand Slams. Um, did you just comment on Monica or her, her family? I mean, did and then also did you um, work with her after she was brutally attacked? Yeah. So uh, my my initial work with Monica was at the Nick Volatieri Tennis Academy. She was there, and. Um, she was one of the, the most extraordinarily kind, uh, very sensitive, just wonderful person. And so was her father, her whole family. Um, they were, you know, they came a long way to give her a chance to fulfill her destiny. She was a very good player in Europe. Um, and, uh, but it, you know, it was a. It was not an easy. It was not easy for her. I mean, she was tiny, but her father 
and Nick and the and she just thrived in that environment somehow. Um, I remember her father coming to me and saying, you know, she's so shy and so timid. Can you help us get a little more aggressiveness out of her? Can we can we get her to be more aggressive? And I said, well, I I can tell you something that I know is very important. That may sound a little strange, but I have done a lot of work in this area now, and I'm convinced it's actually a big contributing factor. And it may work with Monica. He said, what's that? And I said, I want her to attack the ball with her breathing. I want her to actually go after the ball. As she hits the ball, she actually makes an out breath, and there will be some sound, but I wasn't emphasizing the sound. I was emphasizing the coordination of her breathing and attacking the ball with her breath. So they started doing it, and Monica absolutely adored it. And then all of a sudden, you got this noise. It's all like your fault, Jim. Breathing. Now we know. The world knows. It's all your fault. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but I had seen it in all the sports, whether it's karate or anything, you always, mm. the exhalation is coordinated with the striking blow. And, and the coordination of breathing, I had all these players hooked up to all this instrumentation. We could see that how breathing could control heart rate, blood pressure, all kinds of things. And so this brought out an aggressiveness in her. And it was, you know, really quite interesting. And then other players started to show that. And then the WTA became mm-hmm. really upset by all the noise. And they are actually going to put some kind of, um, instrumentation on the course and if you win a certain level you you would yeah. get a point penalty. <laughs> high decibel <laughs> and i said yeah i said no 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 that would be awful i said you can train people to do this but that's yeah, all part of you know um just being uh coordinated with your breathing it's not the sound that makes the difference it's actually the exhalation of the air I remember. and uh Sorry, I was just going to say briefly, I remember when Vic Braden was talking about that when they were going to try to control that, and he said, no, no, you can't do that because it's, it's part, of the motor, no, you part of the motor programming. I, I you know? was when the WTA started yeah. to think about that. I said, that will be one of the biggest mistakes you've ever made. Yeah. So they, they killed it. But, you know, she was a, she's a wonderful human being. She's one of my favorite people, I can tell you. I just adore her. What she's been through, and uh, I've worked with her before the stabbing and then I got a chance to work with her some afterwards after she, she went uh, through all the trauma and everything but she's just an extraordinarily wonderful human being and the death of her father was just completely devastating to her but uh, um, uh, she's just uh, one of my favorites I just I, I love who she is I love how she presents herself I brought her when I was to the Human Performance Institute and was purchased by Johnson & Johnson. They had a scientific congress um, and they were asking me who would be a great person to present on, um, uh, you know, on their, some of the challenges that athletes face and particularly with eating disorders and with, um, uh, with health. And I said, well, let me check with Monica. Monica came and to presented in front of all these physicians, doctors, all the scientific staff from the Johnson & Johnson family of companies. And she had just released her book um, that really talked about her eating disorder and how difficult it was. And she got on that stage and spoke from her heart. We did an interview on stage together, and then she got up and did a presentation. It was not a dry eye. Mm. She was so genuine, so authentic, such a wonderful, deep, thoughtful person. And uh, so uh, I felt very privileged to have had a chance to be involved with her. And I will always feel like she's a gift to uh, tennis and a gift to the world. In her uh, book, uh, the title, Get a Grip, the first sentence is the Einstein quote, if you I think you're going to do uh, the same thing over and over again to get a different result. You're, yeah. you're crazy. But I remember being on the court with athletes and you were to, you would tell them, I want you to breathe from your nose to your toes. And then you said at one point, um, 
you know, just putting words together as far as synchronization where she, people couldn't really say, tell, but she was just going, all right, all right. Braden uh, <laughs> said no one took the ball in, in his day. I mean, he's been pa passed now for seven years, but no one from his studies took the ball earlier than Monica Selish. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was just ferocious. Yeah, I mean, if, she, you, if you'd have seen how they were, how her practice sessions, she would literally go through two or three teaching pros and you'd have to call her back. I mean, she wanted to hit again. She wanted to hit more and she would have these guys hitting with her. They would just be completely exhausted. Mm -hmm. And then they'd have to bring in a freshman. It was like uh, Ray Mancini bringing in a fresh mm -hmm. training a boxer to, uh, to, he'd beat the heck out of the last one. And she would do that and she always wanted to hit more balls. And her father created these and incredible obstacles they put chairs on the court and she'd have to hit around the chairs and curve the ball around or try to get angles and the wildest things you've ever seen but she developed this geometry of the court that no one else had and her father was this cartoonist and he actually understood diagonals and lines and all that and he just used his she wasn't a tennis player but he used his amazing creativity and then when she would uh, get frustrated that she couldn't do it, he would call her over and he would draw a little cartoon on the ball. He's a really good little cartoonist. And she would smile, then go back out and hit again. I mean, it was just really quite wonderful to see. Wow, that's cool. Jim, uh, in regard to journaling, I've heard you repeat uh, quite often, write it, read it, write it, read it. Could you talk a little bit about the significance of journaling to, for the listeners? Yeah, so I'm always interested to figure out how do we get this brain to to execute what our desires are, you know? And I know the brain exists for one purpose, and that is to get us what we want and need. Um, it's the only reason it's there, but it has to be trained. It's not normal to uh, hit a 108-mile-an-hour forehand like Car Carlos Alcantara. Alcatraz, or, uh, yeah. Carlos uh, Alcaraz um, yeah. did last night against yeah. Tsitsipas. I mean, I mean, it's just it takes endless hours of training to do that. And I was always looking for a way to to get the brain to to acquire um, these. So competencies, these capacities, mentally and emotionally, in any accelerated way, the same with character. How, how do we, we know kind of how to build myelin in the muscles, the motor neurons, and you repeat it over and over and over again until you can hit that forehand at 108 miles an hour and keep it in the core. But it takes endless hours of practice. And, uh, and so I was always looking for what, what is the most effective way? Is it reading about it mentally and emotionally and even character wise, or is it visualizing how effective is visualization? We know that the brain works off two basic signals. One is it's a word sensitive computer. We understand, we make meaning out of things with language and we have this very uh, interesting complex capacity for language. Uh, this prefrontal cortex, this executive function, has given us this capacity to really manipulate words and ideas and that. And so our brains, whatever you feed it in the way of words or images, um, actually builds like very similar to what occurs in motor learner, motor learning. Um, in a forehand, backhand, server volley, you repeat it, you send an impulse down a particular, um, you know, neurological pathway, and every time you do it, um, and you do it correctly, it strengthens that um, particular um, neural impulse and pathway for holding up under pressure. And the same thing is true with words and images. So the more words and images you create, that um, really kind of train the brain. You really kind of want to have a, you know, it's, it's, 
it's almost a, a designer brain. You want your brain to, it's not normal to be a great competitor. It's normally getting set to get frustrated, angry, scream at yourself, scream at the unruly crowd, the cheating. It's, there's a lot of normal stuff there, but boy, if you're normal, you will never make a great competitor. So you have to train this brain to do things that are completely abnormal. You miss a sitter, you turn around and you don't, and you reset, you don't even remember it. It's just gone. You might make a little correction. You didn't bend your knees enough or whatever, but you're right on to the next point. That's really uh, a, a very challenging, uh, you know, kind of adaptation for the brain to make. And it doesn't happen without a lot of work. So we tried all this. And the one thing that stuck more than anything was, uh, in the mental and emotional and, and in the character space was handwriting, cursive writing. And it didn't have the same effect that working on a computer keyboard had. That there's something about moving with your fingers um, in cursive writing and connecting to this executive function in your brain. You write a word and it registers. And those words, those sentences, those meanings, the stories, they have a much greater impact than we would have ever been led to believe. We, there are a number of researchers you know, who've gotten into this space, like James Pennebaker and many others. But So this became a, an important part of our training at the Institute, that everyone was, got a journal. And uh, my latest book, Leading with Character, it accompanies, uh, there's an accompanying journal it's a scripted journal for 150 days and um it every day you write for 10 minutes and we piloted that for 10 years and it's really quite profound in terms of the effect it has on people and so i'm a very strong proponent that imagery is really important you can listen to you can put your what the messages that you want to make sure that your brain is listening to and it's always on you can talk into your iphone and then play it back and those those auditory impulses are having an effect on your brain you're training your brain um you can watch a video and that visual um input um is actually affecting your brain what you see and particularly if you pay attention to certain things, not only did it help you with accelerated biomechanical learning, but it's you're looking at what people are doing between points. If you're looking how they handle difficult times and you're watching video, that is a, another form of mental training that we know for sure is effective. And we also know that you can mentally sit down almost like you're meditating and you rehearse exactly how you want things to go that also works um, in, the, in the motor skill area biomechanics and so forth but it also works mentally and emotionally and seeing yourself under pressure seeing yourself in tough situations and and really handling it but there's another that we found almost the most superior in terms of getting things to stick and that is handwriting and journaling on a daily basis. Journaling, there are two kinds of journals. One is it's kind of a historical, this is what happened. And, you know, maybe your negative thinking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you're, maybe it's a catharsis. You try to get it out. You're frustrated. and But then there's another kind of training that uh, with the journal that this is the one I prefer, although both of them can be valuable. And that is, that you're actually training your private voice on how to coach you into the future. So you're, when your private voice goes off the rails and you start ripping on yourself or you start cutting yourself down, you become, you know, a terrible critic of who you are and how you're playing and all that kind of stuff. And then you're actually fighting two battles. You're fighting a battle against yourself and you're fighting a battle uh, against an opponent. And what I want, I want that private voice, that inner voice, the only person who hears it is you. I want that private voice to become the best coach you will ever have because it's the closest to you that anyone. It's the only voice you'll hear until your death. 
And those that private voice can be terribly dysfunctional. And I've spent an enormous amount of my career trying to help people get that private voice aligned with who they want to be, with what they want, with their with the mission that stands in front of them. And that this is their personal Yoda. It's almost like this is where you go for the best coaching advice. Because you know yourself better than anyone. And that voice can be stern, can be harsh at times, can be compassionate, warm. It's just exactly like a great coach would speak to you if they deeply cared. So how would you coach your best friend in that same situation, knowing what you now know is happening? And that voice is always constructive. It's never destructive. It's never punitive. It's actually always encouraging you to dig deeper, to go into it. And so all the journaling is around that idea. And you're actually scripting how you want your private voice to speak to you in the future in all these different situations. And it's been quite effective. Um, Changing the tone and content of that voice can change everything. And it really starts getting what I call uh, a competitive brain going that um, is, uh, is a magnificent thing. I mean, you, you can hold up. You don't run for the hills. You understand where you're getting nervous. Take a little more time. Towel off. Take a deep breath. Trigger some positive images. Follow your, pro- follow your rituals. You have a great coach, exactly what you would be telling your best friend, someone you deeply cared about when they're in a tough situation. So journaling for me is a, is a big breakthrough. I had no idea that this was going to become a powerful training tool, but you can create inputs with reading, with writing, with listening to tapes, watching videos, just going out and doing it and acting it out. There are a lot of ways to send signals to this brain to make sure it gets what it is you want, what you want to have happen. And if you train it right, it'll do exactly what, how you train it. You're going to get back exactly how you train it. The more you go off the rails and, you know, do all kinds of crazy things, the longer and harder it will be to train that brain. It's always on. It's always listening. We, uh, we ask players to just take 10 minutes, quiet time, Reflective thought. I think junior tennis players, most of the time, it's reactionary instead of reflective. But if they were to just um, write down three things, even if it's if it's repetitive, take ten minutes and write down three things. Take their notes and take their notes to a journal and write down three things from the day. Mm-hmm. Um, even if it's just a matter of gratitude and you know, okay, gee, I need to thank my parents. Um, could you touch upon the difference between performance character and moral and ethical character? I mean, I, having read your Yeah, books, so I, um, I, I love that practice, uh, Steve and Andy, that you've been involved with, with journaling. And it's, um, you know, we did that with, with our, we had an academy at um, the Human Performance Institute, and we did, we had a six year, it was directed by Lorenzo Baltrame. Um, but our goal was, to make the number one issue, use tennis to help develop extraordinary performance and ethical and moral character. And uh, we never talked about winning. We just talked about effort, attitude. And every day they had to spell out in their journal what they were going to work on. Then they had to come back and, and rate how they did on that and how much energy they devoted to that on that day. They had to talk about it with their coaches. And uh, we wanted to see if you focused on character and just used, and they were all competitive. I mean, it was like they all played tournaments, and we had an unbelievable kind of consequence of that. Not only did they become more character-driven, but they were much better competitors. They weren't so worried about win, about winning and losing, they played more freely, more relaxed, because whatever happened, they were going to leverage to become stronger. And we had one who went on and played number one and two for Harvard, one for West Point, played number one and two for West Point. They all got basically college scholarships, and they were, I think it was a gift for them forever. And journaling was every single day practice. So That's awesome. um, I was just going to say quickly, Jim, you were talking about how it's better to do your writing in cursive that had a greater impact than just regular print. Yes. um, 
again, it has something to do with moving your fingers and its connection to this prefrontal cortex. I don't know exactly what it is, but that's interesting. It's been a lot of work trying to understand. If you're on a keyboard, you just kind of your fingers fly, and it doesn't seem to have the same impact that writing. But unfortunately, a lot of those kids today don't even don't yeah. even know how to write with their <laughs> that's hands. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, so it may, not, may not be possible, but whenever possible, we do that. We did this with adults thousands and thousands of people um you know probably today some 400 and, or 400,000 people have gone through the programs at the institute and you know this journaling was a major major factor in their success storytelling old stories new stories and so forth so but performance character are all those acquired assets that help you become um, a more successful achiever, and they they're really in the whole achievement world. I always got confused when coaches say, "Well, the team they all play with great character tonight." I'm going, "How does character? What does that work? What is character? Because they won the game, or because?" Well, there are character assets that are driving achievement, and that's what coaches were thinking about. So you know things like. You know, energy investment or effort, uh, things like positive attitude, um, intensity, confidence, um, positive, you know, positive thought processing. And all, you know, there's a whole host. I have 25 of them that I um, have identified that may be the primary ones that drive extraordinary outcomes. You know, everything from time management to um, self-awareness and on and on and they're, they're really important and you can have a boatload of those but you can have holes in the character moral and ethical side large enough for an 18 wheeler to drive through those have nothing to do with what's right and wrong um in your treatment of others so the moral and ethical character assets and these are also muscles just like muscles of your body just like muscles of performance character these are capacities that you acquire over time. The same thing is true with uh, things like being a caring person, being a, a person, an honest person of integrity, um, being a person who has humility and who is generous and um, who uh, has, uh, who is respectful of others, is great sportsmanship. These are also assets and they have to be developed. And great coaches tend to focus on, I mean, most coaches focus more on the, on the performance character strengths, and they're not really sure what to do on the moral and ethical side. But every, every single day you treat your athletes and you see what they're doing with each other and how they treat their opponents, it's fertile ground for teaching these, what I call the most important assets a human being will ever possess. The highest level of personal health is moral and ethical health. If you don't have integrity and honesty, if you don't have truthfulness, if you don't have caring and compassion and empathy for others, if you don't have, and these are not soft, these are, you know, these are really important dynamics that contribute to a healthy human being. If you don't have those assets, um, I can guarantee your life is going to be a train wreck in one way or another. Even though you have achieved amazing things, your ability to connect and relate to others effectively is the gold standard of a human being. And tennis and sports can teach those more directly in this very compressed arena of life as long as you make them the highest priority. And what happens is, you know, people start getting it and they realize that coach is more interested in who I am becoming because of tennis than whether or not I actually won. But if I win and I'm also becoming this extraordinary person of character, most importantly, moral and ethical, but also performance character to win, to win for everyone. So, but the coach has to get it right. And the parents have to get it right. And parents don't again, have the right scorecard. They're all about achievement and those assets, everything from focus, to discipline and all that stuff. They put all their energy and effort into that and completely neglect 
the moral and ethical side because they're not sure how to teach it. And so they just feel like if I get my son or daughter to achieve great things, I will become a great parent, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. And coaches have the same kind of scorecard. If I have eight people with national rankings, or if I have gotten two people into the HEP or WTA, I will have been a great success. And boy, I don't, I don't bite on, I don't bite on that. Uh, I want to know what kind of human beings they became and what kind of sacrifices had to be made, compromises in their moral and ethical character and how you treated them and how they treat others. That to me is the, is the most important dynamic in the whole relationship. Tennis is a gift. But more important than anything, it's who you became as a consequence of tennis because there's no, there's no uh, comparable um, advantage if you compromise who the person is as, a, as a, an ethical, moral person just in the pursuit of getting to the top of the mountain. Yeah, I was just going to say it's unfortunate in the coaching world, as you know, 17 number ones that you can talk about, <laughs> um, that, you know, success for a coach, it's, it's all based on, you know, the credibility is, okay, well, what have they achieved? What's their ranking? So on and so forth. Totally. Not, not what kind of person they become. Yeah. It, back in the 80s, you put together a daily monitoring chart. You know, there was a practice log and, and one of the, uh, you had a workbook as well we used. But I remember, uh, you know, the struggles with just maturity and discipline to get to get young players. It was just one piece of paper front and back <laughs> per week um, to do the daily monitoring chart. Um, with uh, today, Sandlot Sports, when you, you and I grew up, you could ride your bike. And we always say that parents rightfully so are um, overprotecting their children. But in some ways through that, they become underprepared. Uh, Andy spent a lot of time with Vic Braden and Vic, as like yourself, a psychologist, he had a, it was very brief, but he had a TV show called Vic's Vacant Lot. What, what do you think about the safe zone for kids where mom and dad drive them everywhere? And um, don't you think there's a byproduct where they're not becoming the independent thinkers, the problem solvers that kids became years ago? Well, you raise a great point, uh, Steve, and it, you kind of have to be careful how you solve the riddle. This is one of the big riddles. Um, you want to protect them as human beings, um, but let me give you kind of how I see it. Um, parents, again, get the scorecard uh, really backward. And so they, as long as their son or daughter is achieving great things, maybe even in grades, or achieving um, maybe the valedictorian, or is um, achieving great tennis success. Their rankings continue to get better and better. They, the, the parents think, well, I'm successful, so let's make the rest of their lives easy. So let's protect them. Let's take, because they have a lot of stress, let's just try to get rid of the stress so they don't take out the garbage like they should. Well, but, you know, we had a great match last night. Or... And you begin to make the world around them as comfortable as you can because for you as a parent, you know, it's working. You're succeeding because they are achieving this goal that, you know, you're paying a lot of money and everything. So you, you let them get away with a lot. And it's a really tragic miscalculation. Um, if you surround someone with marshmallows and pillows, that will be the only thing they can tolerate. And if you make achievement the number one issue, um, and you can get away with almost anything as long as you're achieving, you can, you know, you can pretty much get all your wants and needs. It really sets up a very dangerous precedent in terms of how life actually works. Just because you can hit tennis balls better than someone else does not make you special in any other arena except tennis. You can hit tennis balls better, but you spend endless hours practicing that. Why do you think you should get privileges in life just because of that? Tennis 
in itself has no value. It has value only in helping you become physically healthier, mentally healthier, emotionally healthier, character healthier. The goal of just high achievement by itself is empty. There's nothing there. As Andre Agassi proclaimed, winning changes nothing. So parents who get caught up in that trap of trying because their their kids are under so much stress trying to do this and that. What they want to do is to help them navigate in those arenas and to learn how to be responsible, be respectful, do the right thing, find use their time very effectively. If they want to have time downtime, they have to figure out a way to do it that is not compromising. You know, they, they can't be in a bad mood all day and treat people like you know, like dirt, and you allow them to get away with it because they won their match, because they became number one in their section. And so, again, it's the parent who is running the show here, at least for as long as they can while they are developing. And you want to make sure what the priority is. And if they if they become number five in their section as opposed to number one, but they're developing the assets as a human being that will help them navigate in life and understand the ranking doesn't mean anything. What matters is the, the kind of person you become in chasing that ranking. And if you don't take out the trash, you treat your brother like, like nothing because you can, you're moody, you're irritable, you're always striking out and, parents, you say things that are, but you let them get away with it because somehow you feel like you don't want to be tough on them because they're working so hard. Now, I'm sorry, that's not the formula. And uh, so many parents get seduced into thinking like that. So what you want to try to do is to help them manage their energy better, help them manage their time better, and help them understand how to take breaks power of pause in life and power they still have to do their homework they still got it you know is it more important that they achieve great things in tennis or that they actually um uh really do well in school as well as tennis if they want to do both but which of those two has the highest priority in terms of who they're going to become later in life how do they deal with the stresses of exams and tennis uh, tournaments and how they integrate up. This is the, this is the compressed version of life. And if they work it out there, they might have a chance of figuring it out because that's the way the world's going to be when they get older. And so I have this, uh, very kind of strong position that I take with parents that do not leave the person in the dust just because they're winning because you're allowing them to develop and don't surround them with marshmallows and pillows because life is not, as long as you're winning, life is not going to allow you to have marshmallows and pillows. Life is tough and you better get strong and you're going to use this to get stronger. And if something falls through the cracks, let it be tennis. I don't want you to fall through the cracks in terms of your treatment of others, your character and, and how you deal with people that uh, have helped you, you know, achieve a lot of things in life. So, I have a, a fairly strong voice in all of that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great advice. I mean, I'm sure uh, this is awesome already. I'm sure the parents are out there are thinking of a million things right now, listening and coaches as well. I know I am. Well, I think with tennis, uh, you know, it's like a young player. They have a chauffeur. They have a chaperone. They're, yeah. They don't. Even, as we know, sometimes they don't even carry their own bag. But back in the day. Um, you mentioned baseball, basketball, tennis. Uh, there's a book called Range where you have a better chance to really be successful as an athlete if you played multiple sports. So I think that's another thing too, is just throw everything but a, the kitchen sink in a healthy manner at a child. But I think sometimes they just get in this tennis track that's so one-dimensional. Ten tennis really, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have an off season. It's just like, it's 12 months. <laughs> Exactly. No, I, I think you raise another critical point. Um, the more uh, the, the key to developing your athleticism is variety. 
soccer um, and even flag football and baseball and you know physical activity get all the muscles you want to develop all the muscles you want to develop coordination balance and tennis should be maybe one of those but you don't specialize too soon because what you do is the body you know if you continue to work the same pathways over and over and over again my father was a was really an outstanding baseball player. He was, you know, good enough to play major league. And he had a son. He had, you know, two sons, and we were out. And so I was large. I was a big kid for my age, and I could throw. Size 15 shoes. And I would be endless uh, hours out in the yard. My dad would, I could throw knuckleballs. I could throw curveballs. I could do it all. And there was no understanding at that time, about how many balls you could throw. You know, today we regulate very carefully how many balls uh, a pitcher can throw because the, the system is not developed. It just isn't healthy to be doing the same thing over and over in the same way. The system begins to break down. And so I was pitching in kind of a miserable day, kind of cold and a little bit rainy, and I, my arm went dead. And to this day, I cannot throw a baseball. I can't throw any ball. I've never been able to get my arm back. It just was gone. Wow. And it was because I, I hit so m- I could still play tennis and I could play basketball, but it forced me into other sports. But my father had no idea that this was, you know, we thought we were getting an, a real advantage. Starting so young and throwing balls at three, four, five, six, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Um, that I would have this huge advantage over everyone else. It doesn't work that way. I would have been much better off playing multiple sports. And and it was a gift having a father who understood everything about baseball. But um, he didn't understand because um, he didn't start that young. And he didn't have his father doing He thought it would be a great, a great uh, advantage for him to start that. And he became my coach. He was my coach the whole time he, he ran the team the whole thing and so all I know is that the more variety you have as an athlete whether as long as it's not in a sport that can cause damage so gymnastics early is great gymnastics later is not great I'm not a real advocate of, of uh, con- full contact football um, because the, the injury rate as you get older um, becomes you know, and then it, be, it affects you. I have so many friends who played sports at a high level um, and some of these contact sports, and they can't walk, they can't run, they've lost all of their limbs. Mm. I mean, they have arthritis because of the brutality of the sport. And you get injuries at the age of 20 or 19 or 18. Those injuries really manifest themselves later on in life yeah. in forms of arthritis and every, everything else. I mean, it's just amazing. Great great thing about tennis. Didn't uh, you and Jeff play some father-son tournaments? Yeah, we uh, we played multiple father-son. We won gold balls. We won (laughs) national championships. Uh, My my last competitive round um, uh, was on grass court, and um, um, we uh, we lost in the finals of the national grass sports um, uh, to, uh, to a team that, I mean, it was right in, in conjunction with the U.S. Open, and that was my last competitive um, uh, involvement with tennis because I had I've started to get some neuropathy, and I don't really know what caused it all, but, um, but we, we played, we had won uh, multiple championships and uh, national championships and it was great but it was one of the most fun um one of the most fun things i ever did was playing father son with jeff and i mean he's obviously an incredible player but we had so much fun and uh great memories and um i worked I, somebody just sent me a, a picture from sarasota where we had the national play court championship and Jeff and somebody p- took a picture of the board that's up there, and then Jeff and I lost in the finals. 
to Jimmy Parker and his son. And we had three championship points and missed all three. Cha- and we lost mm-hmm. the match. I remember and watching they were number the, one. Oh, no, sorry. I, uh, I remember watching Jeff play a little bit in the juniors because I, I started in uh, southern Utah. So I was in the Intermountain. I remember watching Jeff. He's a couple of years older than me, I think. And uh, he's a solid player. And uh, no, I was going to ask you if you've ever thrown your books out the window and just broken a racket. <laughs> Jeff, ever... well, he was my, he was in all of my videos. And yeah, I remember. The thing I was really proud about is one of the most extraordinarily mentally tough, character driven. Everybody who knows Jeff is inducted to the Hall of Fame here, and he's just an amazing, amazing player. And uh, we actually at that tournament. Um, in um, New York, in my final time, we we played Michael Chang and his father. Mm. They were the number one seed, and uh, Jeff and I beat them in straight sets. And Jeff broke Michael with a behind the back, <laughs> like a tweener. <laughs> he went he hit a screaming ball down the line, and that was that was the match. <laughs> and then Michael Chang went on and played in the doubles with. Um, um, who was it? Uh, I'm just trying to think. Um, but he went into the, and they won the 35. He and uh, who the heck was it? I forget who we played. But I mean, we played, we just had a lot of fun. Just a lot of fun. And it's just more fun than it is competitive. I mean, it's very competitive, but yeah, everybody in the father's son, is, they're really good people. And it's just a lot of, a lot of good family time. That's oh, great. you played well. I used to teach. Oh, it was it was, yeah, it was smart. Yeah. What's that? No, you played really well. I used to tease you. Big big serve and bigger feet. <laughs> Size 15 <laughs> shoes. With, um, I have big feet. That's all I know. And that, that doesn't help you in tennis. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, you used to say this. I thought it was great. The number one attribute, you know a tennis player is going to be great if, if they just got it. They just got to hit balls, the feeling of the ball coming off the strings, the sound. Um, it's like that's their drug. Um, how do you get someone to be passionate? I mean, I remember, uh, you know, I knew Tim Gullickson well. I know you worked with him, the late Tim Gullickson. At one point, he was struggling with tiebreakers, and he just had him say, I love tiebreakers, I love tiebreakers. I, I try to tell kids, to, to, I just say, I love practice, I love practice, <laughs> I love the grind, I love the grind. Yep. I love criticism. I, I love, love Steve, criticism. I love Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but um, any thoughts on just how do you trigger that passion for people to just love practice and love the grind? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, the, the tiebreaker was Tom going. Tom? <laughs> yeah, that was Tom. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we came to understand at the Institute that the single, first of all, the greatest single predictor of success in anything is drive. And the reason it's more important than talent, more important than almost anything, because if you're driven, if you're passionate about what you do, you don't really care if you fail. You don't care if you, all these obstacles and right. all the great, you know, setbacks and injuries. You just pick up and keep chasing. And so the secret is to somehow touch into something that really matters to you um, and to figure out how, how does tennis kind of, you know, what is it about tennis that's exciting and what, what and how can you, it's like Andre Agassi repurposed all of his tennis fame, his money, everything to build a charter school for kids, a, a college preparatory school. And it kind of changed everything because it just didn't feel that great about just being a, a superstar was not that fulfilling in and of itself, even though he was wealthy and at number one in the world. When we get the purpose right, and so we spend a lot of time mining for kids why play tennis? Is it because your parents want you to, or what is it? I know when my son Jeff finally, you know, I kept kind of nudging him to play. I knew he could be a really nice player, and he wanted to, you know, but he wasn't really that into it. But the moment he caught fire at the University of South Florida, um, and he started realizing how good he could be, and then he went on the tour and everything else. He, uh, and it has, if you were to ask Jeff, what's the greatest gift, one of the greatest gifts that was ever given to him in life, he would say it was tennis. And to this day, he still is passionate about playing and he loves to compete and he loves, you know, the competitive thing. It was, and it's 
whole family plays. He has three children. His wife is a four or five player. Every every member of his family is becoming outstanding players. He wants to give them uh, a gift, but he's not a crazy parent. He's figured it all out, and you know it's very exciting. And my other two sons, all of their families play tennis. Everybody is competitive. They're all in leagues. They all are nuts about tennis, and they're all getting it wired up right. And to me, that you know is a legacy that I love. That somehow I've started. That uh, it's such a magnificent game if it's actually if you understand why you play it. But the key is your right, uh, Steve. The key is to get the passion, and and you have to figure out what what is it about the game that you could fall in love with. Is it to to become better as a person, to give, to understand how to, you're going to leverage everything you learn here so that you're more of a success in life. You want to be an inspiration to other kids that they can do it. Whatever it is, you got to find it. And that territory has to be mine. And it's uh, because tennis is hard. You have to find something that actually enables you to jump over these obstacles because you're going to take, you're going to have terrible losses. You're going to have injuries. You're going to have disappointments. You're going to have unfair seedings and on and on. And how do you how do you balance all that? Well, you know, I don't know where my love for tennis came. Maybe it's because I couldn't play baseball. But I got ignited by it, and it has been a passion for me. And I, I miss so much being able to play competitively. But I can't do it anymore. But I can still help my kids and grandkids play. And I get great joy out of that. And I play golf. I play competitive golf, and I've got pretty good at golf. And uh, but I need that, and um, I just like what it does for me in terms of helping me focus, helping me be more disciplined, and actually translates into me becoming a little better in every area. And I understand my mind-body relationship better, and I'll do that until I die. So. Purpose is the biggest issue. It's not easy to find. It's not like finding a prize in a treasure hunt. You just fall over and when you get it, you got to dig for it. You got to dig and find it and work it. And finally, you find the reason why you're going to go out there and give everything you got, be all in, and take, you know, if it's a bad loss, you're just going to take it, pick back up, learn from it, and keep right on going. You are not going to be deterred. That, uh, that's a very important lesson in life, and that's why you're playing tennis. That's fantastic. Jim, i got to ask you one hockey question selfishly. Uh, <laughs> Mike Richter. You worked with Mike Richter, a goaltender. We always say in hockey that the forward makes a mistake, the defenseman can make up for it. The defenseman makes a mistake, the goalie can make up for it. But the goalie, my mother used to say that the worst job is being the parent of a goalie. <laughs> um, what was, it like, what was it like to work with Mike Richter? He was a fantastic player. Yeah, Mike uh, is an extraordinary human being. Um, I worked with Mike for eight years. and um, He would come and, in his off season, and we would go through his entire season. And he understood the value of journaling. Oh, my God, this guy is like – and every year he got better, and he had – so many challenges. He had ACL problems. He had, but he, he began to realize how important his mind was. Uh, his mind was everything. And he really came to understand that he could overcome almost anything with his mind. I remember uh, toward the end of his career, he suffered an ACL tear um, in the early part of the season. And they said he would be out. He would definitely not make the playoffs. He was done. And he goes into his uh, physical therapist. Everyone says, "No, I will make the playoffs. I am going to. Fin- I am going to do this. I know I will be the best healing patient you've ever had." So he goes to the doctor, the surgeon, and he said, "I want you to read this note to me while I'm under anesthesia, and I, w- I know that my brain will hear it." And the doctor goes, "What?" <laughs> and he reads it, and it says. He says, this is one of the greatest surgeries I've ever done. Mike is going to have amazing recovery. It was just on and on about how great this was going to be and how everything went so well. 
And he read it. He did it exactly as Mike asked him to. And he thought it was a little weird. But That's awesome. Mike, with every single one of his therapies, I don't want to hear anything negative. I want you to tell me what that I need to do. And I'm going to be the most, I will be the student you've never had before. Wow. And I will, I'm going to make the playoffs. So the playoffs come and Mike doesn't even have a chance to be on the ice. He, he goes out for a little kind of one, you know, one little work. And if you've ever been around goalies, they have to be their eye hand reflexes are, have to be like magical. I mean, it's not to have any time to practice or anything. I had went out, had one kind of shoot around as I remember it. I'd have to go back to my notes. And then he went into the playoff and they played him and he had, uh, you know, a pretty decent game having <laughs> not done anything throughout the whole season. Mm. And then he went in the second, from that point on, he was like the most amazing example of genius as a, as a goalie you could have. And it again is a huge testimony to, he visualized, he did all the work, he mentally prepared, he did everything, but he couldn't do it physically. And literally right out of with no practice, he becomes one of the most extraordinary examples of genius as a goalie. And I, I just thought that was an amazing story. And he is, uh, you know, he was a joy to work with. That's awesome. Yeah, the brain doesn't know the difference. Brain uh, does not know the difference. Uh, Jim, in your beginning days, I mean, obviously you, you're a pioneer. I mean, you really made a big difference with sports psychology. With, uh, with being new to the scene, you had your naysayers. I can remember, uh, you know, Vic Braden, for example, he was not negative by any means. He was always so positive, but he's going, what, what does this guy mean? Blow on your hand and all these rituals. Uh, he goes, you just need to hit it. And, uh, but, and obviously, you know, you've went through the academic endurance trip to earn a PhD and then mm -hmm. with your work ethic and then started working with all these top players. But Howard Cosell came up with the, um, the word jockocracy when he was doing Monday night football with Frank Gifford and Dandy Don Meredith you know, I never played the game. Um, I asked this for trench pros who don't have the credentials academically, perhaps, or they don't have the, the experiences. How do they earn respect? How do they how do they deal with not being a player? We in the tennis industry, a lot of times people who uh, they say we're a really good college tennis player, they go to the front of the line when it comes to getting the job. In all the years I've had right. training tennis teachers, um, you know, what, what comments would you have for someone who's out there in the trenches and because they didn't play the game, like Howard Cosell, I didn't play the game, so I don't have a voice. No one's really thinks I'm worthy of listening to. Well, that's another, another great question. First of all, I can tell you that a lot of the players who were had great careers are terrible coaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just being a great player does not qualify you as being a great coach. There's a profile. And there are countless examples of brilliant coaches. I mean, brilliant, who never played their sport at a high level. Coaching is an, is an art form that is very special. And you may not get to the front of the line because you didn't have these, um, you know, world-renowned accolades um, as maybe some of the people that are vying for the same job but you, um, you will show who you are by your work and by the devotion that you have to your profession. You're getting as much knowledge as you can. You know, you just got to figure out how do, you, how do you get the knowledge and the understandings and the competencies that will make you truly exceptional. And as you do that, people will recognize you. And the fact that you didn't play at a really high level, will have, I mean, there are examples of people who become world-renowned coaches in the sport they didn't even play. I mean, they weren't even involved in it at any high level at all. Yeah. But they became extraordinary um, motivators, extraordinary, um, you know, kind of mentors for people that have won incredible national championships and everything else but your your real gift is to help people understand how to leverage sport into becoming something extraordinary 
how do you become a high achiever and at the same time become an extraordinarily balanced person with great character? And uh, so I would just simply say you're going to, your metal will be tested always and you will be, you will, you will be able to demonstrate who you are by your work, by your devotion, your full engagement, your competencies, your thirst for knowledge. You never stop getting better. Just like a player on the tour, the moment you don't start improving, you're backsliding. You have to push the envelope, get better in every area of the game. You have to stay up with the game. You have to know everyone. And pretty soon people recognize this is a real professional. This is a professional coach. Whether they play at a high level or not doesn't matter. They are the best of the best. And it, they become that because they're so devoted to becoming exceptional in their craft. The, um, the video, I think it was 1985, where you had the 12 units of things that you could do physically to be better mentally. And then you, yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy Connors was on that tape. And at one point, right. Jimmy Connors had, had said, um, well, I think all of that mental toughness is a crock. And but all your time studying in between point, what, what the players do between points and between games, that, that, that's a, I love that tape to this day. I mean, it's fantastic, not only for the 12 units, but it just really shows Connors, he was, he was doing what you were professing, mm -hmm. but he didn't know he was doing it. Yeah. Exactly. And that was pretty much what I did. You know, I, I had this approach when I was I actually taught tennis as well, uh, regular just coaching. Um, and I would look, I would capture the, on video the 10 best forehands in the world. And then I would look at what are those 10 best forehands? What do they have in common? And if you teach those things that are common, you almost never make a mistake. Same thing on backhands, serves, volleys. Take the best in the world who've already figured it out and take the things that they all do in common. And if you teach those, chances are you're not going to be too far off. Um, and so I did the same thing with the mental uh, between point time. I would be looking at who are the very best competitors, the mentally toughest in the sport, and take the 10 or 15 and look at what are the things they're all doing pretty much the same. And then contrast it with people who are not that mentally tough, and what are they doing? And it's like night and day. I mean, it's like it jumped off the page, but no one was really looking at the between point time because everyone thought everybody believed that tennis was played while the ball's in the air, and the rest is downtime, dead time, doesn't have any relationship. But when you look at the stats, you realize that, you know, as much as 50 or 60% of the time in a match, you're not hitting ball. So what are you doing during that time with your head, with your body, with the whole thing? And you begin to realize it's a powerful time. And it's the same in golf. It's about 90 Eight percent of the time, you're not striking a ball, and how you're managing yourself and your thoughts and everything else and the mistakes make an enormous difference in your ability to compete. So that, and I use the you know shifts and in, in uh, hockey and everything else. You know, how do you take advantage of those pauses and get the most advantage out of them? And that was a pretty big insight that I felt was uh, something important for all sports. No, I certainly quote you often from the. We have some film from those uh, courses you ran, those workshops back in the 80s. Number one is you have to have strokes that hold up under pressure. And number two, you've got to be super fit. You know, Vince Lombardi, fatigue right. makes cowards of us all. Um, I do think that many people that are teaching um, the mental part of the game, there has to be, everybody's got to be working together. Um, if someone has an engineering problem, they're going to have an emotional problem. If yeah. they have an engineering problem with their forehand, they're not going to wake up every day and be a happy camper. Yeah. A hundred percent. It all has to work and it may not be, or because you're double following, it may not be a problem with your head. It may be a problem with the biomechanics don't allow you to have enough degrees of, um, of, you know, um, comfort in order to because everyone gets tight if you get if you double fall every time you get tight probably not your head it's the biomechanics <laughs> of your serve that needs work yeah, exactly yeah the, we um going way back to the 80s i know a lot of our 
former students uh, who will be listening to this tape. You've you've helped out so many people. Um, it's, it's, you need a major, major league thank you for everything you've done for tennis. Yeah, I really want to thank you and acknowledge you for all you've done. I know personally for me as a kid, you know, it was the 16 second cure. That was that was the tape. You know, we all watched and probably made me get a mullet. <laughs> to be honest, but uh, there was some beautiful mullets in that tape, but the information's great and timeless. That was Jeff with a mullet. Jeff, Jeff had a mullet, I think, in that. That means... Uh, Jeff Jeff was a little guy that threw his racket and yeah. stuff on the court. Yeah, the haircut meant, it meant uh, business up front and party in the back, right? Exactly, yeah. No, I remember there was a guy with a bulletary shirt, it was a big flowing blonde mullet, definitely would have won an award. But um, no... Yeah, no, I, uh, I've been really fortunate to have you know connections with so many opportunities and i just hope i've moved the ball forward and you've had a remarkable career um as has andy and i really appreciate all the contributions you've made to the game i know you were a real devotee of vic braden who was a giant um and uh but you you're a student of the game you study i mean i really always felt you were one of the real um, intelligent approaches to the game, a very comprehensive approach, and uh, you've made a big mark on the game as well. So thanks for all you have done. And oh, um, I just hope we continue to make contributions. Yeah, there's so many things that we could talk about. Jim Verdict, Tim, mm -hmm. uh, Dennis Vandermeer, Bill Jacobson. But what happened is uh, 1981, I was 26 years old, so that was uh, 40 years ago. So what we've done from the people that we studied under, and, and we really studied it. So when we say we, we, I mean, we had students reading your books and being tested and your films, your audio tapes. And one of our students said a long time ago, Richard Hernandez, tennis needs a great base initiative. So we've been calling for several years what we do, a great base. Now, I know Andy says we shouldn't be pigeonholed because be brilliant with basics, the Lombardi theme, it works all the way to the very best players in the world. Yep. But I, our mission is uh, to try to help, you know, beginning tennis teachers, beginning players, because I mean, at one, and I'm, I know you have been so proactive with the PTR and the USPTA. I've been a member 40 years and was a tester, but it just, I think we really need to do a much better job teaching people when they first get in the game, because it's not that easy to, Hit a forehand, hit a backhand, hit a serve. But what you've done for the great boys, I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, even just everything you said for parents, I think that can help as well. Just, okay, how to get your kid off to the right start and where to put your priorities. Well, I'll tell you, it's been a gift. Uh, tennis has been a gift in many ways, and uh, I will always be grateful. And uh, hopefully uh, we can get more people involved and improve uh, – you know, the stickiness of tennis, because I think it's one of the greatest gifts in sport. I think it's a much, I've been involved in all the sports, nothing compares to tennis uh, in terms of its lifelong uh, contribution to development at all stages of, of at all ages and stages. So yeah, I think uh, I was, we'll, uh, I was just going to say that go we got to get to wrap it up. But uh, my, my message from this would be, you need to become a student of Dr. James Lair. I think with, it's just too easy to push a few buttons on YouTube and think, okay, now I can go give it a tennis lesson. Yeah. Where, where can they find, you know, your, your, I know you have dozens of books or, you know, 17 books. Um, where can they find more information? Do you have a website? Well, or? um, you know, I, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I do podcasts like this all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and my website is, Jim Dash Lair L O E H R dot com. Okay. And I have a lot of my stuff on there and as you said, I have lots of books, seventeen books out there floating around somewhere. Um <laughs> but I try to uh try to keep my website fairly current and uh with all the websites that I'm doing or with all the podcasts and stuff, so still trying to make a contribution wherever I can. Jim, I right. have one of your books currently on my phone to start listening to it. How many of your books can you listen to? Do you know offhand? I really, you know, I really don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. a lot of them have the audios, but yeah. that's 
something I don't really know how many of them, a lot of them, you know, they were written so many years ago. So I don't know what's available um, on audio currently. And uh, most of my books were on audio for a while, but they're probably out of, out of stock now. <laughs> yeah. Check out audible. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll put the website, the links in the show notes and yeah, time to study, study more. That was great though, Jim. But no, thank you so much for your time. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve and Andy. Appreciate it very much. And I'm with you guys all the best. You've made a real contribution. Oh, thanks. And thanks again. Yeah. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day, Jim. You going golfing? Thank yeah, you. go hit the links. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, well, maybe some point. Keep your head down. You left arm straight. That's all don't I know. Go, don't throw any clubs into the woods, all right? Stay mentally tough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All, all right. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that was great. I tried to sneak in the question there, you know, did you throw your books out the window and toss your racket once or twice? But yeah, I think he, he crept around that pretty well. That was good. With, uh, he's, that was amazing. I mean, I, so much so much great stuff in there for, for parents. I mean, we've got to listen to this several times again. I yeah. I learned a lot. With uh, amazing man, amazing contribution. Yeah, definitely deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. Tennis Hall of Fame. Fun. Um, no, no, for sure. With, uh, no, the thing about, um, so many questions when you, you, you know, someone, it doesn't take long to just really kind of instantly, uh, catch up with him. Mm. Um, I was telling Jim a story on the phone the other day. He was coming in to Tyler, Texas to run a workshop and a young man called me up and said, well, I'd like to be part of the workshop. And I said, oh, okay, no problem. You know, just, uh, um, I'll hand the phone over to someone and they'll, they'll take your information. So, no, I yeah. really want to be part of the workshop. He's like, well, <laughs> what, what do you mean? He goes, well, Jim Lair is coming. I want to have uh, breakfast with you guys, lunch with you guys, <laughs> dinner with you guys. You wanted and, the VIP ticket. And, you know, we built a program up where we had close to 100 people, 100 students from yeah. all over the world studying tennis. Mm -hmm. So we were bringing people in from the surrounding areas. Uh, I don't know, people did fly in for a workshop, but for the most part, it was okay. We were coming from Dallas and Houston. And mm. So we had over well over 200 people. And this gentleman was so interested in spending time with Jim Lair, was just ultra, ultra positive. Mm. And so at the end of the workshop, I said to Jim, I said, you know, everybody loved it, but one person, <laughs> one person really just couldn't stand you. They just didn't like anything you said in the, it was just scathing. It was profane. It kind of, it was, they were so critical. And he said, well, who was it? And I said, it was that guy, Bryce Young. But it was Dr. Bryce Young, who with mm. his wife, they've gone on and, and yeah. really touched their lives. But um, if that's just a good example of, uh, you know, a Bryce Young class act who, you know, he molded his career, I think, really so much after Jim Lair, like so many other people. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm pretty sure in tennis or when you think of mental toughness, you think of gym and I know for myself, that's, you know, the 16 second cure and the 12 sets of mental steps to mental toughness. Those, those two were the, the foundation, you know? Yeah. I think when you're asking the question about like, we, you get mad at the, at the, with the, with your golf shot <laughs> is Jim would remember Eddie Parker, one of a funny guy, great guy. He used to just every once in a while say, uh, hey, Dr. Lair, have you read your books? You read your book because he just would be out there being a, you know he's a world class human being but he would be out there and it's like hey this guy's read his book but he he needs you know he needs to reread read that that one chapter yeah exactly no but I thought, no so because everyone even you know you think of there might be a few exceptions but even like say a, a Federer yeah um, way back when of course he, when he's a teenager it's common knowledge where people study tennis but. Um, there might be one, there may be like a Stefan Edberg, there might be somebody who, who never really got upset. Yeah. Um, On TV that we know of, yeah. Fantastic player. Yeah, and the other, you know, great takeaway I thought from this conversation was the journaling. You know, I thought it was neat, and I, you know, I particularly found that interesting with the cursive, you know, writing in cursive. I gotta, I gotta go back to my cursive, you know? Do, do, Cause when I write, I haven't written in cursive in a long time. Well, you know, Vic's name came up where you know, Vic was ask, asking me about Jim because uh, I was both in the Vandermeer camp and the Braden camp, and they were superstars mm -hmm. in the 80s, Vic Braden, Dennis Vandermeer. And, you know, Vic was, at, like Jim, a student of the game, and, you know, he, Braden really 
thought what he did was fantastic. But at first, it, Jim was so new on the scene. Mm-hmm. And what's this guy doing talking about your walk and your in-between point, what you do with your eyes and what you do with your breathing. And, and you know, it's it's we always uh, get um, tight cast for grip swing body. Mm-hmm. But there's just so much more to it. Yeah. But I like what he, I think what he said at the end, um, I can remember we had a, a great day for tennis. It was the University of Illinois women and the Tyler Junior College women. Mm. And Jennifer Roberts, who'd been our program, she's building the program. And uh, we at Tyler Junior College, I was running the program on Interbasis, the the team. And we had- Jennifer Roberts was at Illinois at that time, right? Right. Yeah. So we had, uh, it was like an immigration center, Tyler Junior College. I ran this program for tennis teachers, but- I remember running the team twice in, in between hires where they had a mm. old, three coaches when I was there. As interim. So um, we didn't have an American. You know, you do it, okay, <laughs> these, these are the players. Mm-hmm. Actually, Scott Stewart, we had one American, top six boys, top six girls. But what an amazing weekend is that Jim came in early and we filmed the matches. We charted the matches with Jacobson's Compu Tennis. Mm. You know, Jim is walking around taking notes during the dual match. And then we had a weekend with both teams, then the tennis tech students, then all these tennis enthusiasts, mostly coaches, but parents were there as well. Mm-hmm. And that was a great weekend for learning. Yeah. You know, that's really, I think, um, Javier Palenque. Palenque, who said education, education, education. Yeah. And... But I can remember Jim, and I think it's so great that you know, he, he knows tennis backwards and forwards, but he, you know, so he look in the video and he would just say, you need work from a technician. Yeah. You need sound biomechanics. Yeah. And he said, you know, you're just not gonna make you mentally tough. Yeah. If that's your forehand. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, he can give you some coping skills. <laughs> yeah, so Braden learned to love what Lair contributed, but Vic used to say, um, if you're going to go to battle, and it's terrible that there's always been a war on planet Earth, but do you want a pea shooter or do you want a bazooka gun? Yeah. And, you know, if your serve is like throwing up a grenade and running underneath it, yeah. you're not going to be mentally tough. You're going to finish second in a field of two. Um, but, you know, I think obviously we're just in the in the tennis world, but Jim has gone on and you just think about helping someone on the bomb squad. Yeah. Okay. A little pressure here. With uh, yeah. versus Stay in that, the that, moment. That, little, that little yellow ball going between the white lines. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's check out. I know we uh, are we're on course where our podcasts are now under 45 yeah. minutes. No, I mean, I, you know, I felt like I had a million questions along the way, but it was, it was great listening to him speak and I could listen to him for hours. Um, oh, I think yeah. he's prolific. He's one of the best speakers in tennis. Easy. Yeah. Easy. That was great. Hopefully, listeners, you got a lot out of that. We'll put in the show notes again uh, where you can find jim com. find out his books. Um, I know he does have some videos on, on YouTube. You can see like 16 Second Cure. I know that's on there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, the, time, timeless, you know, evergreen information. and Yeah, the tape I mentioned in 1985. It's, you know, it's just like anything, yeah. you know, um, with I think a John Wooden you know, never mention winning. Winning's a byproduct of skills. Mm-hmm. And I think the parents, everybody, character, character, character. Yeah, character muscle. You know, if, how's it go? Um, don't let the scoreboard manage your life. I mean. Yeah. Don't let the scoreboards manage you. You manage the scoreboard? No, that's not it. Anyway. You need to right. work on that before you write it on the bathroom wall. <laughs> for sure. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Episode 60. 60. Moving along here. Six oh. Six oh six oh. All right, we're rambling. Thanks again and we'll catch you in the next one. Yeah, thanks. Adios. Sabi Zane. Juice.